Yeah, great. So, so thanks everyone for joining and it's really with great pleasure that we're presenting on the results from this study today. Um, Kurt's already given you the title for it. I really have to acknowledge the fact that though I'm a co-PI, um, this is really not my effort. <laughs> um, I really have to thank the project team on this call here today. That's Andrew, Ariel, Andrea, and, and Jessica, as well as Luis Argueta and some other consultants that we've had out in the field. Um, for their excellent work on this. Uh, can you give me the next slide, please? So it's a big problem we're trying to address here. It's part of the, you know, the the, the problem that, the, that this administration and past administrations have faced for several years, and it's, it's how to deal with um, the, the new flows coming from Central America, as well as to a lesser degree, flows coming from other world regions. And our focus has really been on the current immigration policies in Mexico and the Northern Triangle countries, um, as well as to a lesser, lesser extent further south in Costa Rica and Panama. How can they influence both lawful and illegal migration flows? And, you know, the policy hook on this is what improvements can be made. How can these regional uh, policies be coordinated better? Uh, how can they uh, capacity be beefed up for them? Um, how can we manage the, the regional migration flows, thinking of them as both employment and humanitarian flows? And so for the next slide, I want to turn it over to Andrew to continue. Great. Well, thank you, Randy, and, and thank you to Kurt, the CI team, and thank you to everyone at DHS, to, to Morgan and to Michael and everyone in the uh, Western Hemisphere uh, team of, of policy team at DHS. Um, we uh, wanted to, first of all, you know, we, th there's a lot you, we, you, we was a managing regional migration. What we wanted to look at specifically was institutional capacity to manage migration in Mexico and Central America. Obviously, we have we have colleagues that look at this a lot in the U.S. context and and what the U.S. needs to do. But but this was an opportunity really to see what capacity um, in the region beyond the United States. And so one number one was assessing Mexico's capacity to manage migration flows, to cooperate with the U.S. in combating smuggling, to provide protection to migrants, um, as well as settling and integrating some of them, and to continue removing migrants to countries of origin. So number one was Mexico's capacity. Number two is the capacity of Salvadoran, Guatemalan, Honduran governments to manage migration flows, address the root causes of migration, to accommodate repatriated nationals, what to do about returns and, and reintegration, and to enhance their asylum systems. Number three, we added this on as we were doing the proposal. This wasn't originally part of it, but, but we really thought it was important to understand how Costa Rica and Panama, who always get left out in these conversations, but how they were doing on regional migration, both because they're playing a big role with the Northern Triangle, increasingly so, particularly Costa Rica, but also other nationalities who are passing through Central America. You'll hear about this from Jessica in a bit. Um, and then we wanted to understand more fully the legal frameworks in Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Costa Rica, and Panama. So we actually have some, some products, um, very specific sort of draft products that are about the legal frameworks that, that went into the final report. And we wanted to recommend some policy options to manage flows um, from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras through Mexico, the United States, as well as other flows happening in Central America, which is sort of step back then at the end and say, you know, what would a regional management strategy around migration look like now that we've looked at some of the institutional capacity issues? Um, next slide. Um, we did a desk review of laws, policies, and programs in the countries of study. Um, we we uh, actually published some briefs on, on the legal framework in each of the countries, um, which are on our website and cited in the major report. Um, we did a review of publicly available data, including census data, statistics uh, on, that were available on migration and asylum issues in all the countries. We looked extensively at budgets, particularly in Mexico, where this was more accessible. Um, we had hoped to do lots of in-person interviewing, and then COVID hit in the middle of this. And so what we ended up doing, fortunately, we had a fair number of relationships in these countries, um, but we ended up doing lots and lots and lots of, of video interviews. So we did over 75 video interviews. For the main project, we did another 20 interviews um, for a separate publication that will be out shortly on Mexican and Mexico as a as a recipient country of immigrants, um, which we thought was important and really came out of this work. And another 36 to look at African migration, which is an area we really 
narrowed into and looked at very specifically as we did our Costa Rica and Panama work. So we looked more broadly at Costa Rica and Panama, but we thought that African immigration, because it was growing so quickly, was particularly important. And it has some real peculiarities that need to be dealt with differently. Um, finally, there are a set of research reports. Um, there, the big report is on institutional migration management capacity in Mexico and Central America. That's been lost already. Ariel Ruiz, who you'll hear from in a moment, wrote a very good piece last year assessing the U.S.-Mexico Migration Cooperation Agreement after one year. So that was kind of an interim um, report that we did looking at the state of cooperation and, and what Mexico was doing in particular. Um, but now we have the final report as well. And then Ariel and Andrea Tanco and Paulina um, uh, Ornelas, another colleague of ours, are about to put out a report looking at immigrants and returnees and reintegration in Mexico, Mexico as an immigrant and return destination. And then Jessica is finishing with a colleague, Caitlin Yates, another short report on African migration in Latin America. So we signed up to do one report, um, Kurt, but uh, and, and, and Morgan, but we uh, we, we kind of um, kept going from that point. So we hope it we, it's useful to the broader discussion to have some of these extra products as well. Um, and we felt it was valuable to, you know, that some of these things that we thought were important just didn't lend themselves, you know, without making the, the main report 200 pages um, and no one would ever read it, um, didn't lend themselves to doing that. And so we went down the, the, the path of trying to break this into a few pieces on, on additional topics that we thought were really merited. Um, and with that, let me turn it over to Ariel, I think, right? Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Randy. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it is uh, really a, uh, a great experience to go to talk to you about some of the regional work that we've done and really with this uh, really hallmark piece for us to try to consolidate the capacities of Mexico, Central America, including Costa Rica and Panama here is, was a really big team effort, and I'm very thankful for, for my colleagues here who are with us. Um, I, I know that we're limited in time, and so I want to just give you the, the overview perspective of the regional report that we will call it here. Again, that's the one that focused on the, on the, on the countries in Central America and Mexico. The key pieces that we really looked at through the interviews and something that came across uh, very quickly as soon as we began to look at it is how uh, each of the countries is in actually different stages of their migration um, management systems and hopefully that will be uh, um, i think something that we can take a lot of value out uh, after this report sort of um, extends beyond the the period that we looked at um, in, in the last several months so the first thing to note is that um, and this is the regional findings comprehensive uh, but we'll come back to the end uh, looking at the specific countries the first thing to note is that there's growing attention to um, essentially how migration functions with each of these countries this is not something that has been as prevalent specifically in central america we have understood mexico had already begun to look at this issues of migration management before but the key component here is how central america is adapting and as we will talk about more of the incipient legal frameworks that they have um, this doesn't mean that there are, uh, of course, uh, still a lot of uh, patchwork of, of legal frameworks that need to be sort of ironed out, but the key component here was that people are beginning to think and begin to identify themselves as potential regional migration management managers. The second piece is that uh, across the board, it has capacity to uh, to do border and internal enforcement really uh, picked up in the period that we began to look at, the uh, at this study, specifically in 2019, but carrying over to 2020. Uh, we saw and we have seen, as I'm sure uh, all of you are aware, uh, Guatemala and Mexico's new uh, sort of defining role, and specifically Guatemala here as a new player in migration control, uh, though El Salvador and Honduras are also now more, in, more um, part of the picture. Then we looked at asylum capacity, and one of the key components here that we looked at was the key agencies that understood and actually work with the migrants to provide protection pathways for folks. The key component and the two ones that really stood out to us was Mexico, of course, because after 2018, it received a significant number, uh, about 71,000 uh, applications for asylum, and then now uh, is actually continuing to grow and, and perhaps will break the record of 2019 this year. And then Costa Rica, which for a long time now has had actually a pretty uh, flexible and adaptable asylum system uh, in ways that uh, could really lead to be an example for other countries as well in the region. Asylum capacities in Guatemala with the ACA 
was a, a trial uh, that, that occurred, but really stopped and didn't go through the full process. And then the other countries didn't really have a, a significant capacity. The incipient legal frameworks that I mentioned to you, and this is sort of where not only the components that we looked individually at each of the countries, but overall really came into play, looking at specifically Central America and how it's beginning to organize its own uh, frameworks to identify not only institutions, but actually what they can do in the future with the work they're doing. Um, in, in Guatemala, uh, for attention for labor migration pathways, which is actually something that we're going to continue to look at, uh, Guatemala had, uh, in, you know, notably one of the key components of beginning to uh, establish a database that could allow migrants to actually potentially look for work visas in the United States and Canada. Um, and so for us, that was a really important piece. I'll be very brief on the limited capacity of reintegration and reception. One of the key things that we've looked in previous studies has how in Central America reception centers and other mechanisms for return migration actually having um, off and on over the last several years, but reintegration continues to be one of the key sort of missing pieces here. In Mexico, the key component that we looked at, and I'm going to go through each of the countries or the sections of the countries rather quickly here, uh, is that Mexico's migration policy essentially has become reactive to enforcement migration flows. This was, have, this was true in 2015, in 2019, and we're beginning to see some of that again in 2021. Um, and that has resulted in a stop and go approach in how it implements its reforms that it's actually trying to do to improve its own, uh, and modernize and improve its own migration system. Um, this have, has occurred to different uh, shifts in power from Secretaria de Relaciones Exteriores or the Foreign Ministry uh, now in, in the lead in this work in policy making process where before it was the Interior Ministry um, and key components here with Command really stepping up with the, uh, the key components and the assistance from UNHCR, which uh, has to be, uh, I think, um, really um, developed in future conversations. Uh, more uh, and perhaps more recently, the um, ending of the of child detention center or the ending of the detention of children in Mexico was also a big player where the implementation still is lagging somewhat behind. In El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras, uh, which to me was per perhaps the most important or the biggest learning piece of this conversation was to begin to understand how each of these countries are beginning to adapt with their institution and uh, institutions of the legal frameworks. And the key component that really stood out to us was that even though that their institutions are just beginning in some cases, for example, in, in Guatemala, where the Migration Institution for Enforcement just became established last year, uh, there has begun to be some really uh, promising, uh, I guess, experience and capacities in the in the countries that really were not um, as visible beforehand. Um, El Salvador, we understood, had uh, at the time that we were discussing the only border enforcement uh, uh, unit uh, per se in the region. But now we understand that also Guatemala is working with the United States to be able to increase its own enforcement at the border, uh, at their borders. And so I think we'll begin to see that develop quickly. Um, but overall, weak asylum systems continue to continue to prevail. And unlike in Mexico, where UNHCR has a now, I think, pretty big footprint in how they conduct asylum and other work, uh, it still continues to be um, unclear what will happen with um, asylum protection systems in Central America per se, um, after the ACA, of course. In, uh, in terms of labor pathways, I mentioned to you already, uh, Guatemala in the lead here. Uh, El Salvador has had some conversations with employers in the United States. Honduras is maybe a little more behind, but they're also all quickly thinking of how can legal pathways actually be an alternative to irregular migration and promote some key components and, and transit to the, to the region. Um, infrastructure, I mentioned to you already, uh, perhaps the one that's most ahead of the three countries in terms of capacity is El Salvador and reception. Uh, Honduras had actually picked up relatively uh, quickly last uh, time that we looked at the study for, for in terms of their inter integration mechanisms, but more recently uh, after sort of uh, a period of lag uh, in terms of their the reforms, uh, reintegration systems in, in, in Honduras have actually fallen back a bit and Guatemala is sort of beginning still. Um, <clears throat> the last piece on this that I think it's important for us to think about is that there's actually beginning to emerge a regional conversations, whether it's under new or previously existing mechanisms for them to for my for the for the governments to speak with each other, which now has become more than before, at least 
uh, a really key fo focus on how to actually talk about migration together. Um, it's still not clear to us how fruitful that will be, but the fact that they're talking about this more quickly, that they're beginning to develop these capacities, I think is a significant important step for us to highlight. Um, Costa Rica and Panama, I think, are the, the way that we describe them is sort of almost opposite stories here, where Costa Rica has developed a key migration uh, legal or migration pathway, uh, management pathways and, and frameworks that are tend to be pretty um, regularized and in the books per se. Um, Panama actually has led most of their migration um, management systems through uh, presidential decrees and other more reactive policies that really limit its ability to conduct or to at least keep up with some of the work that we had. We actually had significant uh, um, troubles trying to, to, to really dig through all their, the work that they had and their, their key policies. That said, they're still uh, both uh, exposed to different and new migration flows from uh, extracontinental migrants, as I'm sure that uh, my colleague Jessica will talk about. But the key component here is how they, been, how they have become to adapt uh, with uh, Venezuelan migration as well, coming through the, that part of the, country, that part of the region. They both have, be, have become more and more coordination approach with the region as well. And I think we'll begin to see Costa Rica perhaps be another key player and a key destination as we have, uh, Andrew and I have argued in other uh, pieces, become potentially another key player here in addition to Mexico and Canada as a potential solution, a potential destination for protection seeking migrants. Um, in terms of the approach, so what, and this is probably the, the key piece that I really want you to take away from the presentation in this setting, is that in total, after looking at the, the way that migration systems are set up in the region, we devoted and we under, tried to frame the, the current systems under a uh, sustainable and reflective or uh, sustainable and, and flexible migration, migration, regional migration system that includes four key components. The first one is to begin to develop pathways so that actually um, irregular migration begins to lessen as people uh, begin to find ways to move, not just to the United States, by the way, but to other countries seeking uh, uh, employment. Second, create humanitarian protection systems. And I think you've, you've seen perhaps other work that we've done on this uh, topic that looks also at finding protection closer to home for migrants, uh, thinking about what institutions or potential avenues and mechanisms could work and then investing in professionalized immigration enforcement. Something that we found was the role of military and police forces in Central America that has actually increased significantly. And one of the key uh, sort of uh, understandings from this capacity was that there was significant uh, allegations of uh, human rights violations and to then understand how to professionalize and make that more efficient, I think will be in the benefit of all the different countries that we looked at. And then finally, uh, developing governance and rule of law continues to be perhaps the biggest component that the governments are struggling to do. Um, we, you know, you may have seen a lot of the different dynamics that are happening right now in the region, in Guatemala and El Salvador most recently, uh, as of this weekend. The benefits that we hope that, the, that this takes away for all of you working uh, on these issues is to understand a little bit better the different legal frameworks that exist. And again, we didn't go into the details here, but that you can have that in the back of your pocket to understand how potentially and what capacity these governments have to continue to work and collaborate with each other, but also with the United States in the future. And then, of course, our research, as we do with other projects, is to try to understand and, and inform other pieces of migration for the general public to really understand and cut through uh, the media uh, narratives and, and, and discussions, understand what is uh, happening at the border, but also what's happening in the region and how uh, migration flows uh, sort of manifest at the US-Mexico border uh, as a symptom of a larger regional migration crisis. Um, I'm going to skip because of time, the Mexican migration management piece that we did. I'm happy to answer that question at the end. We basically looked at the US-Mexico cooperation agreement in 2019, and the biggest thing that we found, in addition to an increasing assessment of MPP that is no longer uh, active, uh, is that Mexico increased its enforcement under the National Guard. And I'm sure that my colleague um, Andrea will mention that in a moment. So again, we can come back to that for the sake of time. I'll leave it there. So Andrea. Thank you, Ariel. Um, so building on what Andrew, Sealy, and Ariel Ruiz uh, talked about, as we were conducting this project, we identify a window of opportunity to look at the question of integration in, in Mexico more broadly. And there were two main reasons for this. One was that the interview findings, as well as recent data from the Mexican census and other um, data sources, 
we're supporting our hypothesis that Mexico is indeed becoming a destination for a larger number and more diverse num and, a, and a more diverse group of immigrants, refugees, in addition to the number of returnees that come back to the country every year. So, you know, I won't go into the numbers, but in general, the Mexican census show that the immigrant num the immigrant um, population in Mexico has grown from 1 million to 1.2 million. And same with the number of asylum applications that Comar has received since 2014 to 2020 um, that come to 177,000. And just, you know, the majority have been received in the last two years. So we uh, identified that with additional investment in their capacity and institutions, Mexico could mediate the flows um, and migrants could begin to see Mexico as a long-term destination. The second reason why we decided to look at the question of integration was that it is really in Mexico's best interest to do so. Because by investing on immigrant integration, they could also support that reintegration of their own nationals. And this will be a really large area for potential US-Mexico bilateral engagement. So our bottom line is that Mexico possesses a comprehensive and robust legal framework on migration and humanitarian protection that meets international legal standards. However, there are large gaps on the immigration policies and how these are implemented in practice. I won't go into all of the findings of our report, but I do want to highlight you know, some of the main uh, key findings. First of all, migrants and refugees face significant structural, bureaucratic, as well as administrative barriers that hinder their long-term integration into Mexican society. Two factors that we really need to put a lot of attention in the upcoming months and years is one, the lack of identification documents that in turn limits their access to basic services, such as health and education, which are actually established by law um, that are rights that migrants, um, despite of their immigration status, should have access to. And the second one is that limited regularization or legal pathways for certain immigrant groups. Um, this is particularly salient for migrants who are in transit, who have decided to stay in Mexico, um, or migrants whose legal status has expired after they, hold it, they, they were holders of the visitor card for humanitarian reasons. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to this later on, but these two, lack of identification documents and lack of re regularization pathways are one of the most pressing issues in terms of integration. Third, we found that there's an uneven distribution of services and other forms of government support due to arbitrary practices from public officials or the lack of awareness of certain legislation. For example, some public offices um, are still requiring proof of legal state or identification documents, even when the law doesn't establish so, such as for enrollment to schools or other support um, of social welfare. Fourth, as the migrant population and the refugee population is becoming more di diverse, language barriers and the lack of interpretation services are restricting access to key information on legal procedures and forms, as well as the right to access basic services or other support services that are available to them. Fifth, we are also identifying that there's a mismatch between the migrants and refugees skills and employment opportunities. Some of this comes from the lack of linkages uh, with potential employers, challenges with credential recognition of certain profession, as well as companies just being unaware about the legal procedures to hire foreigners. We are also looking at how Mexico could expand the legal and labor pathways um, so that it could accommodate the demand and supply for workers and work opportunities that exist in other regions of the country, especially in the central part of Mexico as well as in the northern part. The last two points that I want to finish with, um, and Ariel, if you can you know, move on to the next slides, is that the public attitudes from the receiving communities towards immigrants have also evolved over time. From a general positive attitude towards immigrants, we're seeing that there's a more negative perception of immigrants um, growing in the country. 
And this is mostly due to media coverage as well as the political messaging. And there's some surveys that show that the perception towards immigrants really differ um, based on the country of origin of these immigrant groups, uh, with Central American migrants actually having a more negative um, perception among Mexican nationals. Finally, uh, we also identified that many immigrant and refugee communities are facing major setbacks. Some of our the interviews that we conducted said that the setbacks have been, you know, two to three years um, going back in time. They've lost their primary source of income, their jobs, and some has faced evictions due to an inability to afford rent. Um, next slide, please. I want to just um, conclude by highlighting what are some of the factors that might be leading to these, um, you know, barriers. We are identifying that there's legit gaps on the legal framework. This is especially on how to manage transit flows and regularization pathways and certain um, arbitrary authority vested upon migration authorities. Third, uh, second, there are legit bureaucratic and administrative barriers, such as processing costs and fees, or there's an uneven outreach of potential beneficiaries to these programs and government support. Um, building from that capacity uh, question that we tackle in the first report, there is a lot of lack interagency coordination and among different levels of government. And something that we have also found um, that in the last three years under the AMLA administration, there's been limited financial support coming from the federal government to state and local governments, as well as civil society networks who really serve the needs of immigrants and returnees. Um, what is really interesting is that many of the barriers that immigrants and refugees are facing in the country are similar to those that Mexicans face upon the return. So I just for the purposes of time, um, if we can move on to the next slide, you'll see some of the recommendations, but I'll be more than happy to, to delve into this in our Q&A session. And with that, I would like to pass it on um, to my colleague, Jessica, so that she tells us more about extracontinental flows. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so one particularly complex area of migration management that uh, arose for us while we were doing this main study uh, came about in terms of managing African transit migration. Um, this is a flow that's been increasing since 2013, reaching a peak so far in fiscal year 2019, um, when 5,000 migrants from 35 African countries arrived at the U.S.-Mexico border without proper documents. Um, in that same time period, Mexican authorities apprehended 6,000 African migrants. And while this may not seem like a peak compared to a lot of the Central American uh, and even Mexican numbers that we see at the border, um, this is a population that faces unique challenges while migrating, that presents unique challenges for transit country governments, and that's likely to continue growing uh, in the coming years. So my colleague and I investigated migration drivers and routes of African migrants, as well as the ability of transit countries in Central America and Mexico, but also in South America to manage this migration. So to start, we found that most South and Central American transit countries don't prioritize Africans in their migration management policies. This isn't surprising, mostly because Africans are a small population compared to other migration flows like those from Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, even Haiti. Um, and migration management policies are already somewhat minimal, um, although they are expanding, as my colleagues have touched on. Which this leads to our next finding, which is that migration management is really mostly limited to facilitating transit northward toward the United States and Canada, and then carrying out enforcement in some exceptional cases. So all Central American countries except Nicaragua actually provide African transit migrants some form of documentation that allows them to continue their transit northward through the country, but typically does not allow them to stay legally uh, for the long term. This is partly because there's limited capacity to remove migrants who don't qualify to stay. 
Um, and this is for a couple of reasons. First is the cost of removal and the cost of detention leading up to removal. And then the second is the lack of diplomatic presence of representatives of migrants' home countries in these Central American countries or in Mexico um, in order to coordinate removal. So it becomes very logistically complicated and expensive to carry out any removals. There are some cases in which enforcement and repatriations of Africans are conducted, mostly in Panama and Costa Rica. Um, in addition to a limited capacity to conduct enforcement, most Central American countries and Mexico do not make legal status or humanitarian protection very accessible. This means that officials might not inform transit migrants about statuses that are available or make it easy to apply for asylum. Um, and generally, there's a lack of translation and interpretation available to make migrants aware of the legal systems and the immigration options in the countries they're passing through. But there's also a larger problem, which is that even if these statuses were more widely available, as things stand now, it's unlikely that many African migrants would want to stay. We heard again and again from interviewees that migrants were driven to leave the South American countries that they initially arrived in, like Ecuador and Brazil, due to racism, and that they continually experienced racism and discrimination along the migration route. So taking these findings into consideration, we put together several recommendations for the US government, regional governments, and international organizations. Um, and that's Perfect. Um, so the first uh, is for the U.S. government to create resettlement opportunities for African migrants in transit. Um, so we know that the current administration has advocated using the refugee resettlement system more in Central America for Central Americans. Uh, we think it would be worthwhile to consider including African migrants in such a plan. They often have strong refugee claims and they face unique challenges when migrating. Their claims could be adjudicated in Panama or Costa Rica, where there's already significant infrastructure in place to house transit migrants, and they could be resettled in the U.S. or in other partner countries. We also recommend funding a voluntary return and reintegration program for African and uh, potentially other extracontinental migrants in Colombia and Panama. The most dangerous point along the route that African migrants take through the Americas is through the Darien Gap which is the jungle between Colombia and Panama. Once they realize some of the dangers of, uh, of crossing the Darien, some African migrants who may not be fleeing refugee situations might prefer to return home, but not have the funds or the travel documents available to do so. So IOM has a lot of experience running voluntary return and reintegration programs for migrants in other parts of the world. And it would be worth trying to implement one in either or both Colombia and Panama. For transit country governments, we recommend making interpreters and translated documents available for all immigration processes. African migrants are often left in the dark as to their immigration options, but also their own legal statuses in transit countries. Um, and we've seen this happen a lot in, in Mexico, particularly since later 2019, when Mexico started issuing uh, designations of statelessness to African migrants that they were largely unaware of. And then our next recommendation is to provide anti-racism training to officials in immigration law enforcement and public service agencies in transit countries. Um, African migrants report experiencing immense and persistent discrimination from government officials, ranging from being denied education or healthcare based on their skin color to being ignored by police when they're victims of crimes or targeted for violence by security officials. Um, the racism they experience often deters them from staying in Latin American countries and pushes them to continue to the U.S. and Canada. But with bare bones budgets, it's unlikely that immigration agencies would be able to fund interpretation and anti-racism trainings to the degree that's necessary. Um, so we also recommend that international organizations should fund these measures. And finally, uh, we recommend creating a public information campaign on the Darien Gap. Um, to better assist migrants in understanding the dangers of the Darien Gap before crossing, uh, international organizations should create a campaign in the languages migrants speak. Um, if we think that if this um, if this campaign were implemented in conjunction with a voluntary return program and an increase in resettlement opportunities 
This combination of solutions could reduce deaths in the Darien, facilitate returns of migrants who want to return and don't fear persecution, and uh, help to adjudicate the claims of those who do fear persecution earlier in the journey, taking some pressure off the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew again to uh, wrap it up. There we go. Hi there, everyone. Um, just to, as we said before, I mean, we have Ariel's publication one year after the U.S.-Mexico agreement, which you've all seen, um, which really looked at, at what happened um, a year after the June agreements. Um, we have now put out the Laying the Foundation for Regional Cooperation Report, which is the big one that incorporates everything. It's in English and Spanish. And we have additional uh, resources, country profiles, which is the legal framework um, for in English and Spanish for each of the countries under study. And the two more reports coming are the one that Jessica just talked about, about African migration, and the one you heard from um, Andrea talking about the Mexico as an immigrant receiving country. And so those are on their way as well. Um, and with that, I think we'll open it up for, oh, here's the rest. Um, yes, we also did a, um, a, a webinar on June 8th where we launched this and we did a, um, a quite well attended meeting. I know Sub Morgan and Michael, if you're on with us now, I mean, some of you were there for a, a quite good meeting um, with different stakeholders from the region, from the United States, uh, from governments and civil society, international organizations in March. Um, and we did a, 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 a webinar last year as well. So um, a lot of activity on, on one grant. We really appreciate it. What our goal has been to maximize um, the trust that you placed in us um, at BTI and at DHS. Um, continued impact as we continue, you know, hope to continue to be part of the conversation with all of you on um, the, the US government's development of regional migration solutions beyond the border. Um, that the knowledge of legal framework is useful in understanding some of the challenges going forward and some of the opportunities um, that, that this can help, this work can help identify priority areas for U.S. collaboration and investment with specific governments. Um, we hope we've been able to facilitate dialogue among government institutions um, and between government and uh, international organizations and civil society, and also uh, trying to strengthen public knowledge on regional migration developments. And so, with that, we turn it over to all of you for questions and answers.